it's a skill set, absolutely, to develop uh, communication skills that are able to convince people that you're able to do a job that you've never done before. And that's it. Business of Architecture, episode 302. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. My name is Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for growing and running a fulfilling and profitable architecture practice. Today's guest has been able to achieve in an accelerated time frame something that takes many architects and designers a lifetime to achieve. In the matter of just over three years, he's been able to grow his design-focused practice from himself up to a team of 17 people, doing projects as small as renovations or little tiny cabins in the outdoors to a 10,000 plus foot square foot modern masterpiece on the hills overlooking Beverly Hills. Today's guest is Matthew Rosenberg. He's the founder of MRAD Architecture. MRAD's work has been featured in numerous online publications, including Design Magazine, including Arg Daily, and Dwell. Now, in today's episode, the audio quality was kind of hit or miss, so I apologize if there are some audio glitches in today's episode. However, I felt that this story was so incredible that you'd get a lot of value out of the episode anyways. So without further ado, let's jump into today's episode with Matthew Rosenberg, founder of MRAD. Welcome, Matthew, to the Business of Architecture. Hey, thanks so much for having me. So tell me the story of the founding of MRAD. How did this all begin? Yeah, so, I mean, I won't go all the way back, but I started this uh, by myself out of our apartment in mid-city Los Angeles in 540 square feet. And I just realized that I wanted to work for myself and I really wasn't very good at working for other people. So I figured I could go look for a job uh, or I could look for a client and I had better luck finding clients than finding a job. Tell me about that. What do you mean you had better luck finding clients than finding a job? I was very particular. I mean, I, when we came back from China, I worked over, over in Beijing for a year, came back after that and realized that I needed to look for a job. But I was very particular about what kind of company I wanted to work for, about what type of work they were doing. And it was tough for me to find a match in terms of that realm. And then also I you know, I was very design oriented, always wanted to push the boundary in terms of business. And it was very hard to find a company who was doing all of these things. And so I figured if I was going to spend time working for another company where I didn't really make as much money as I should be making and spending 80 hour, 90 hour weeks, I could be doing that on my own and doing exactly what I wanted to be doing. Tell me about the transition. So did you just walk in one day, hand in your papers and said, hey, I'm out? How'd the transition happen? How'd you end up setting up your firm and get that initial cash to start going? Yeah, so when I was in Beijing, I was working over at MAD Architects. Uh, lasted about six months or so, maybe a little bit longer. And even then it was, you know, I was given a large team of people to design and build out these projects and even then it wasn't quite right we were the hours we were working were seven days a week you know 16 hour days and it didn't make any sense to me that i'd be working that hard getting paid that little and not doing exactly what i wanted to be doing and so left there tried to start a little company a prefab company over in china uh, had some complications learned a ton of lessons very quickly and then realized that it was probably time to move back to la and then that was really the transition. And it was that I could look for the job, which I did a little bit, or I could just start knocking on some doors. And so I really targeted certain people that I believed would be good people to work with and work for and knocked on their door until they opened it and hired us for a little bit of money. What were the, some of those critical lessons you learned in the prefab experience? You said there were quite a few important lessons that you learned during that time. Yeah, trust is a big thing uh, and your instinct is a big thing. And I trusted certain people in terms of what they would get done in terms of the relationship and the business and really didn't fully understand both how to operate legally and through proper documents, but also it was China things are done quite a bit differently there. And so there was 
certain almost instincts that I was able to develop that I still use today, figuring out, okay, I can trust this person. Maybe I shouldn't trust this person. And, you know, we visited, we were, we were funded over there actually. And then all that money sort of disappeared overnight and realized that we didn't have control of the whole process. And so that really led us now into our current business of controlling as much of the process as possible. Got it. And when you say funding the business, so you had, you had people funding and you said you talked about this idea of trusting and, and you're going on instinct now. If you had to describe the things that you, you see that sort of put up a red flag, when, when, what are the things you're seeing when you're hesitant about trusting someone? Whether they've done it before. Uh, meaning, and that could be numerous things. Uh, if they, for example, if they're, say, land buyers that all of a sudden want to become developers, I realize now that maybe those aren't the right partners to partner with when developing a project. Those guys flip properties, they don't develop them. So there's, it's almost as though we look for people who are now experts in their industry because we're young and we're growing. We need people who know exactly what they're doing and we need to trust that they're going to be the best of the best in what they're doing in, in our partnership. And we work very hard to become the best of the best in what we do, but we can't have four people who are trying to figure it out at the same time. We need since we're still figuring things out and we're evolving, we need to partner with the best of the best in the industry. Got it. So let's jump over to the early days. You had moved back to the States. You said that's where you ultimately started what is now MRAD. Tell me about that process. Yeah, uh, a lot of lessons for sure. It's a lot of fun though. And, you know, signed a couple of clients for smaller projects. I mean, there was actually one downtown LA that was six stories we started doing renderings and visualizations and interior design for them at $800 a pop. And for me, that was something. It was just me. If I could do four of those and making $3,200 a month, that was okay because I was doing it on my own. Um, and then there was another guy who was a family friend who allowed us to design his pool house and through that process, we fig I figured out how to permit through Los Angeles. I was at the city every day, had no idea what I was doing, and just went there and asked as many questions as possible because I was getting paid to learn, essentially. And so once that happened, I got a little bit of confidence, and then I really started focusing on the people that I wanted to work for and work with and started hitting up some big developers in New York. And still, it was just myself, but I was start starting to really build out a book of work. And I would do that not by getting 10 clients. I did it by locating sites, by designing something on those sites, and by making projects on them. And I would try to find the owners of those sites and pitch them on that idea. And so I was always trying to curate my pipeline and curate this body of work that didn't actually exist yet so that we could try to get bigger and bigger clients. When you say you reached out to your look, you're on the hunt for clients, developers during those early days, what was your approach to be able to make those connections? I basically was selling the idea of that we were a new company, that we would provide a much broader and more in-depth service for the same or less. And, you know, it was just me at the time. So it was absolutely faking it till I made it. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. And I don't really believe anybody actually... Uh, does it any other way when they're starting out. And so I'm very honest about that. I mean, still today we do that to some extent, but uh, I would, you know, I built out a book of work, uh, work, that, work that I was curating and actually just creating on certain sites in LA. And then I would email them this book. I would find their phone number. I would find out where their office is and I would fly to New York every four or six weeks. And until I got meetings and got in their office and got face to face, I would keep knocking on their door, keep calling them, keep emailing them. And I was basically persistent until they said yes and agreed to meet. And I had a list of about 20 people. And most of those, almost all those people we've signed as a client today. And I picked those people because I was either interested in their past projects or I believed that they were going to do something on their own in the future and leave one of their larger companies and ultimately, that's a great client for us because they'll, they need to use younger, younger firms and younger studios because they can't actually afford 
these larger conglomerates when they're starting out on their own either. In, in terms of pitching, when you have this when you have this initial meeting with someone, how did you develop your skills? And let's call it pitching or whatever presentation. Tell me about that meeting. How would that go? How would you how would you approach that? I was for sure very nervous at the beginning of all of these meetings. There's no doubt about it. And it became, I mean, I was a very, very shy kid. And I think I'm still shy today. No one would believe me if I told them that. But it's a skill set, absolutely, to develop uh, communication skills that are able to convince people that you're able to do a job that you've never done before. And that's it. And, and that all comes down to communication to a belief in someone and a trust in someone, but that starts with communication. And so I just basically kept development. I put myself in very uncomfortable positions as often as I could. And through that, you figure out how to do it and you learn what works and what doesn't, what certain types of developers like to hear and what others don't. And some of them give you five minutes. And if you can't pitch them in five minutes and convince them that you are going to do a better job than anyone else, that's your chance. You don't get another chance for three years. So that pressure is quite helpful, actually. Meaning? Meaning you have one chance to get a tower in New York. You better make that five minutes worth it. And so there is absolutely pressure involved that I think I worked really well under. But there was also things you could do around that. So what I do now and I, I think I did it then as well as I would try to develop and figure out their network around them and actually communicate and develop a relationship with people around those people so that they would hear our name from multiple sources before I actually met with them. And by doing that, I mean, I sort of have this thought that if they hear our name at least three or four times before I meet with them, it's a done deal because they've already trusted their network and they've heard it from their trusted network. Do you have any of those meetings that come to mind where you went into them, you were very nervous, understandably at the beginning, you went through them, you're sweating bullets, you gave what you thought was a decent presentation, or maybe during the middle of the thing, you just, you walked out of there. And this is the question. You walked out and you thought, man, I just blew it. I mean, that is the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened. I dropped the ball on that one. I feel like such an idiot. Did you ever have one of those experiences? <laughs> I think I had one last week, actually. They still, they still happen. It doesn't happen that often because you can typically... When you're sitting in a room with someone, uh, I still feel like I have a one of, I guess, the successful trade is I'm able to sort of negotiate with people in a way that I can discover what they actually want. And if you just talk and listen to them throughout that process, it's a journey through that conversation. It's not as though I have a set idea in mind. Yes, we both want something from the conversation, but if... I was wrong in what I thought they wanted. I'm able to maneuver throughout that conversation and we can both find a way at the end that we both have benefit from it, from a relationship with each other. Um, but last week I had an interesting interview with someone and she came in the studio to tour the studio and I actually wasn't able to develop a rapport with her. And that hadn't happened to me in at least five years. And so I wasn't quite sure what it was and i'm still quite baffled to what happened actually so when you say you couldn't develop rapport meaning meaning there wasn't a reciprocal feedback she didn't provide interest or questions there wasn't a conversation being had it was a struggle to last 20 30 minutes it's interest there didn't seem to be something even though she requested the meeting uh, I wasn't able to discover what she wanted out of it. Interesting. And so to this day, you're still not quite sure what she wanted out of that meeting. No, <laughs> I'm sure I'll figure it out in five years. How, how about an, uh, any experiences earlier in your career in the beginning that were excruciatingly painful from that kind of perspective where you just felt, man, I just, I screwed this one up. Yeah, there was, there was uh very early on, there was a big developer out of New York who I was able to get a meeting with. And the first time he was so distracted and I wasn't able to get his attention, I thought by the, by the end of the meeting, I just thought it was over and I didn't stand a chance. And, you know, I followed up, obviously didn't hear back several times. And then finally, I was like, okay, I'm going to fly back out to New York. I'm going to 
go to his office. I'm going to call him. I'm going to figure out how to, and it wasn't actually our conversation. He was distracted by many other things. And that's very common, right? Everybody has their own intention and there has to be something that you're offering them. That's more valuable than the other side that's pulling their attention away. And so that's something else I discovered that everyone's very busy. Everyone wants something from someone else, but we can also all offer each other something to help support the betterment of community, of sustainability, of anything. If we can find out what that common goal is between us early on, then everybody can focus that attention very efficiently rather than me trying to grab someone's attention. If I can figure out now early on what they're interested in, what they're capable of, what their strong suit is, then we can essentially use each other to create benefit. Now that can be difficult to discover. What's your process for discovering that when you're sitting down with someone? I try to do a lot of research on people uh, beforehand, actually. I I don't, I'm not a big reader. I'm not a big researcher, but when it comes to people, I like to know as much as I can about them. So, I mean, it's a lot of internet research. That's what goes into it. If they're writers or um, if they speak, I try to listen to all of their talks. I try to read their books. And that gives a lot of insight into someone's thought process and what their interests are. Uh, I mean, that's a big part of how you discover where someone's going to go or where they want to go. And if there's alignment between, all right, I'm actually interested in those things, we can probably partner on this. And when you do that research, you actually save everyone a ton of time. How did you initially discover these developers? How did you find them and identify them? Yeah, I mean, I would look a lot on real estate blogs um, and then look at, you know, you look at architecture and real estate blogs and then sort of track back to who the capital source was or who the developer was on that project. And when their name kept coming up, I would put them on the list. If there was three projects that I was interested in that I, they were involved in, they would get on the list and then I would work at finding what their cell phone number was. And what was the process for finding their cell phone number? <laughs> um, just researching. I mean, there's no like secret site that gives you cell phones. Although there were a couple that I tried. It didn't really work. Um, I would go to tech conferences and there was one tech conference. Uh, this person was pitching this guy. I told them what I needed. I said, you know, I need access to their information, which is what everyone wants and needs. You can't go on the yellow pages and call someone up anymore. Uh, like, you know, the Steve Jobs story where he called up, I uh, can't remember what his name was, but called him up and wanted to intern for him and he just called his, his home phone number. That's not so easy anymore. So there was this tech conference where they were selling the idea that they created a platform that if you, you know, you pay your monthly fee and they all find that cell phone for you. Of course that didn't work. And nobody wants that to work anymore. But there's ways to find it. I mean, you call the reception, you say, there are certain ways to sort of get access to people if you tell the right story to the right person. I know that's not very precise, but. I got it. I got it. Sounds like a lot of innovative thinking, applying those, uh, applying those design skills to the actual networking process. Yeah. It's storytelling. Yeah. Matthew, when we look at MRAD, you have a, you have a distinctive business model, a bit different than other architecture firms. Tell me about that. Yeah. So a few years, probably about four years ago, we really started talking about fixing the industry. Um, the, that came from this place and many conversations that I had with colleagues, with the seven-year-old person mentor in the industry. Everyone's frustrated. They're frustrated because they're working too many hours. They're not getting paid what they think they should be getting paid. And the liability is enormous for architects. And I always started wondering now, why do we keep complaining? Everybody in the industry is complaining about the same thing. That's not right. So the whole purpose of this mission and the business is to look at the problem at its core, which is too much liability, not enough money, working too many hours, right? And you look at other service industries like law, they work very hard. They work many hours. Their liability is not as high as architects even, but they're getting enormous hourly wages, And it's crazy. You look at medicine. While medicine's a little more unstable these days, uh, 
you know, they're getting paid appropriate salaries. They probably deserve more, but, and I sort of wondered why other service industries that had liability and worked this hard didn't have the same problem with finance. So I wanted to solve that problem. We now do it by essentially extending the scope of the architect. So we still do architecture and we push the design and innovation and structural capabilities and any part of, and programming and community. We push all of that in terms of the architecture and design. But we also do pre-architecture. And pre-architecture came about really because we realized we were doing a bunch of free work for developers to try to get projects with them. We would do free zoning analysis. We would look up sites for them. We would try to do due diligence for them. And we would do it for free, right? We would do probably twenty twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000 of work for free every time to try to get that job. And I realized that the developer isn't actually doing that much. They're sourcing the site. They're doing research on the areas, sort of, but they're not really talking to people. And so we started researching cities and communities and neighborhoods, looking and sourcing sites that developers don't look at. And we look for untapped areas where development opportunities might exist, and we can actually program and look at it differently than developers. So we are already doing that. We're just doing it better. And if we're doing it for free already, there's no reason we shouldn't include that as part of our scope or become developer, which is essentially where we're leaning to. So we source properties, we tie them together, we actually source the capital and equity as well. We bring that in, and when we can, we keep a piece of the equity of that project and the property. So we have equity in over 10 of our projects right now. Now, we also hire ourselves for the architecture, so we control our pipeline. That's the other part of it. So we create some revenue through equity because the dividends pay out over the course of time. So it's sort of our safety net. Hire ourselves for architecture, control our pipeline. And then the post-architecture is interior design, custom products, uh, anywhere from a custom faucet to utensil to a fragrance, which we're now taking to market in the next four months. Anything that goes into the experience of the spaces that we're designing that hits the five senses, we want to create products around it. And we want to tap smell, sound, touch, all of these things that go into our brand memory sense to create stronger brand recognition. So not only are we creating revenue verticals for ourselves by being able to take these products to market and sell them within our hotels and our apartment buildings, but we're also creating stronger brand recognition for our projects, for our architecture. So all of these things feed back into each other, create stronger products at each stage of the pre-architecture, architecture, and post-architecture, and they create multiple revenue verticals. So this is essentially the business model that's starting to work. And what has been the difficulty of that kind of business model re- uh, related to a traditional practice model? It's, uh, it's risky in the sense that we, for, we still forego fee for equity at times, right? We, just because we bring in the property, we can take a little slice of the equity, but then we like to roll over even more fee or put in cash at the same time. And we're, <laughs> you know, we're spread very thin at the moment because we've invested in so many projects. One, I can't help myself, but two, it puts the the developer in us or the capital and the architect in bed with each other. We're partners. And so we all believe in the same vision and the end goal. We want a successful project and we want to create better spaces and buildings for people. That's it. That's the capital and the development partners we bring in. They have to believe in the same vision that we do. But we're invested so heavily in so many sites and projects at the moment that cash flow becomes a huge problem. So there's a cycle for this. And I imagine it's probably about eight to 10 years where this thing becomes extremely sustainable, where dividends start paying out. And then it's not as critical that we have the cash flow coming in because dividends can, can start paying for that. So that's the risky part of it. I think we have to survive 10 years to really prove the business model. Great. And what are you doing to survive right now with this decreased cash flow? How are you making it work? We are trying to take products to market faster. So really in the last six months, we've, uh, we brought, we're bringing in a gentleman from Thomas Heatherwick's office who's been very focused on products and market. And we're trying to take uh, as many products to market as quickly as possible now to start generating revenue through those other verticals, which we haven't really focused that much on. We've just been prototyping in R&D. And now our focus is taking it to market because we need to generate revenue. 
Tell me about your team culture. You have also an interesting theory on building a really strong team culture in the firm. What do you do to keep the best people around you? Yeah, it's been a lot of fun <laughs> to try to figure out new ways to keep them interested and dedicated for long term. Because that, the whole goal of this is to make them happy, is to make them happier than any other office, and ultimately to publish all of the salaries and show Gensler and I'll call them out and all these bigger firms that I believe should be paying more than they do, that there is a different model. And I think that they should abide by it and they should start paying their people more and giving more benefits. And as a very small company, we offered full benefits from very early on. And that was, that's a huge hit. It's an extremely expensive expenditure. Uh, we also allow people to take any time off that they want, any time of year. Um, obviously if they take advantage of it, they're probably not the right fit and we release them. But everyone on the team loves that. I mean, when you give every, everyone the option to just take time off when they need to take time off, they don't really do it. Right. But the, the option is there. The freedom is there. Uh, and then what we're moving into now is allowing them to purchase into the projects that they're working on. So they can give a little stake, you know, $100, $200. It doesn't need to be a lot, but now they get to have some ownership of these projects that they're working on and see small dividends pay out over the course of time as well. So again, it gives them more ownership of what they're actually working on. So they're not just working for someone that they don't really know and a project that they work on and then don't see again. They become invested in this thing in a way that we're all invested in it anyway. I just want to really give as much ownership to the process as possible. Awesome. And how about finding the right people? What's your strategy around that? Yeah, it's, we've, had a, we've had a lot of struggle, actually. I mean, we used to run by the model of hire and fire, where we would see if they worked out. If they didn't, got rid of them really quickly. That hurt us very early on. You know, we did in the first two years, I would just, I, I sort of ballooned um, very quickly and then realized that I brought in people that weren't capable of doing the projects that I was bringing in as quickly as we were bringing them in. And, you know, that hurt us on reviews online because we didn't think about it. We didn't really understand the complexity of employment and what their needs and wants were. And so now we've started looking around the world and we have a lot of people on visas and we go through that process. It took us nine months to bring the gentleman over from the UK, it took us eight months to bring someone from, the Hong, from Hong Kong. But if they're interested and they've proven valuable for these other companies, I mean, these, they've been at, one of them was at this other company for nine years. The UK guy was at this other company for six or seven you know, they're dedicated employees and they believe in the business model. And those are critical factors. And all those people aren't in the United States. That's the truth. We've tried that. There's a lot of entitlement still. Uh, and we're really looking for people around the world with different experience who are dedicated to growing a new type of architecture business. How do you, speaking of reaching these people around the world, let's talk about social media for a minute. Do you use social media in the businesses? And if how, so do you, how do you use it? And what impact does it have? To be honest, we haven't been great at it. <laughs> We've tried. Uh, I brought on a, a marketing manager at one point for a long period of time. Didn't work out too well for us. I haven't been able to stabilize and understand the full feedback of that. Not to say we don't use it. We post on Instagram. Uh, that goes through to Facebook, but we have to see a return on those dollars. And so I'm still interested in the messaging capability of social media, but I don't, the clients that we go after are, I still don't believe that we find them from that source. I think that there's a conversation to be had through social media that's important, but we are so focused on working with the right people and in those critical people to build out this model that our message isn't necessarily uh, ready to be told. And so we've been just this year, we've been slowly doing a lot of media stuff, which we held back on for the first five years. And now we have some projects that are completed. We have a bunch of projects that are about to be completed. I think now's our time that we can start that narrative. There's definitely a couple people who are very good at social media and that's what they do. Um, I'm not sure what the life 
span of that really is or the return of that is though. If there's one critical business lesson looking back that you've learned, what would it be as we finish up our conversation here today? Be be persistent and tell people exactly what you want because most people assume that everyone else knows what they want and knows what they want to do and they don't. But the second you communicate what you want and are persistent with that communication, there's a clarity and understanding from everyone around you that they're there to help and they want to help. Awesome. Well, thank you, Matthew, for joining us today on the business of architecture. Thank you very much for having me. And that is a wrap. As a podcast listener, I'd like to invite you to two free online educational seminars for firm owners. The first teaches you how to structure your firm to avoid the overwhelm and fires that plague so many firm owners. If you're ready to move from overwhelmed operator to excited owner, visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar to access this free online training. The second seminar you can access shows you how to attract your ideal clients to your firm consistently day in and day out. Go to architectwebinar.com to access this training. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.